Okay, Tim, could you please start? Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Ohio Goes I'm from where I'm at right now, Aloha. But it's like he's staying in uh, Hawaii right now. <laughs> I'm very happy to join you this morning and uh, give a status update. Um, this I've made this a little bit different. This is going to be a little bit different format than I normally give because uh, it's going to be much more focused on the recent conferences I've been to. So this one is my Linux Plumbers Conference Report and Community Status Update. So. There we go. So uh, what this talk is going to cover is a report on recent conferences, including ELC North America, Plumbers, and something called the CKI Hackfest. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about some community discussions uh, that were held over the summer on a mailing list, mostly from K Summit Discuss. I will do a little bit of technical stuff, uh, talking about recent kernel releases releases, and then I have a few miscellaneous notes. Again, uh, none, none, none of this stuff is a comprehensive overview of, of everything. It's just stuff that I've seen. Uh, I kind of take notes on uh, things that I think might be interesting for embedded developers. And so here's the major outline. I'll start with DLT and then, then go through each of these major categories. So starting with Embedded Linux Conference was held uh, this year. It was in uh, San Diego, California in August. So about four weeks ago. Um, and my report is just kind of some of the sessions I saw, uh, some of the discussions I had in general impressions. Most of the presentations are already online. There's a few that have not been uploaded yet, but you can find them on the eLinux wiki at ELC 2019 presentations. Uh, so the sessions I attended, um, unfortunately, <laughs> when, since I'm running the conference, I uh, end up uh, sometimes missing uh, a lot of sessions, but I was able to get to a fair number. Um, I saw uh, you might be a maintainer and not know it, uh, regression testing with Fuego, DCC and Clang optimization, CV monitoring and management, testing laboratory API, and these other ones, open source license variations in Linux and Android, Toybox versus BusyBox, creating a BT, a Bluetooth PAN, USB RN disk router, um, and then USB arsenal for the masses. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what was in those sessions. Um, ELC had a lot more content than this. I think we had 55 or 58 sessions. And so, you know, I was only able to get to about 10 of them. It's a little bit like a, a circus. You have, to, you have to decide what you're going to look at. Um, and these are the ones that were interesting to me. So uh, if you, uh, you should definitely go to the presentations page and see uh, if there are topics that are interesting for uh, what you're doing in your work. So this one, uh, you might be a maintainer and not know it, was really uh, uh, just kind of an introduction to how to be a maintainer by Frank Rowan. Uh, he's the, one of the kernel vice tree maintainers. Uh, when you add a driver to the Linux, you may not realize it, but you suddenly become a Linux maintainer. Um, and there are several ways to deal with that. You can kind of ignore the role. Uh, that's frowned upon. Uh, because once you've contributed code to the kernel, it's kind of your responsibility to help keep, help maintain it and keep it up to date. Uh, one of the things you can do is uh, is just advise the subsystem maintainer. Like you gave your driver uh, to say the media subsystem, you can advise the media people whenever you see things come through and kind of give them advice. Uh, you, the next level is to actually go in and review patches, especially patches to your system, you should be reviewing them and giving a thumbs up or thumbs down to the subsystem maintainer. And then the next highest level of uh, dealing with it is to actually get super involved and start your own tree, start accepting patches, integrating them, and, and porting it on to uh, the subsystem maintainer. Um, so there's levels of, of work you could do, but, uh, and you should look at Frank's presentation for all the details, but basically, uh, you. As, as the author of the driver, you should participate in the flow of patches that go uh, from independent developers to the upstream maintainer. One of the big reasons for getting code upstream is to have other people work on it. But uh, they need your help and your guidance. Uh, your job is to make your upstream maintainer's job easier, not harder. 
uh, by giving him your pet, uh, you've made it a little bit harder because he has now, now has much more to maintain. Uh, but you can make it easier by helping him out. And then uh, obviously help contributors. Uh, and really, contributors are helping you. They're fixing bugs, uh, they're increasing the features, and uh, extending it to use cases that you hadn't considered. And so making your driver more valuable and the kernel more valuable. Another talk I went to was it uh, was an interesting one called Regression Testing with Fuego. It was about converting LTP syscall tests into performance measurements. So uh, this talk had a really good overview of Fuego. It was uh, done by uh, Hirotakio, Hirotakio Motai, Tai san from uh, Mitsubishi. Um, he added a time logger to Fuego. Uh, he used S trace. Uh, he had a system for using s to measure the duration of syscalls that were performed by LTP. And then the purpose was to detect performance regressions in the syscalls, even if the functional tests were passing. So you might be running LTP and getting all passes on the tests that it's running. Uh, but if you dig a little bit deeper and, and measure the performance, uh, you might see that uh, some of the tests are, are actually taking longer to run. And, there's, and so that might actually be something that's uh, useful information to see that you have a regression. Uh, in syscall performance. Um, another one I went to uh, was GCC Clang optimizations for embedded. Uh, this had a good overview of different compiler options available. Uh, but more importantly, it had a whole bunch of tips. And so you really kind of need to look at the presentation for all the detail on the different tips for how to make uh, make your code more amenable to, to compiler optimizations. There's a lot of optimizations available. Both GCC and Clang have uh, lots of different features. Uh, increasingly, they're doing uh, something known as link time optimization. Uh, but some of the tips that uh, Kim Raj gave uh, were always, always measure to make sure that uh, as you use optimizations, you're getting, uh, you're doing the most important optimizations first and spending your work on that and creating a baseline so you can compare against uh, to avoid working on stuff and finding out that you haven't had any effect or you've had a negative effect. Uh, you should use good tools or lots of tools that are available to you uh, to test your optimizations and to examine the code. And you should examine generated code uh, actually at the assembly level if you can to see, see what the compiler is doing when you turn on the optimizations. The goal is to help the compiler optimize for you. The uh, compiler has optimization options, but you can actually structure the code differently and, uh, and have an impact yourself. Um, if you can provide hints of the code, you can move hot, hot code path, hot code into the hot path. So you can, there's macros like the likely and unlikely macro used in the kernel that can tell, tell the compiler what code you expect to be run more often and which ones should be optimized. Uh, you can refactor your code to help tail recursion. Uh, there's ways of structuring the code so if you have recursion, you can, if you avoid processing the return value, it allows the compiler to optimize that many, many more uh, optimization steps. So that was a good talk if, if that's what you're looking at. Another one I went to, uh, because some so many people are, have kind of expressed an interest in this, was uh, CVE Monitoring and Management. CVE stands for Common Vulnerability and Exposures. Uh, these are the, the worldwide way of uh, expressing uh, security uh, risks or vulnerabilities in code. There's actually a national database in the US uh, that's available, it's available online. Um, and uh, the speaker noted that embedded do-it-yourself CVE tracking doesn't scale. Um, there's just too many CVEs that are getting created every year. Every year there's more and more of these. And so you just can't do it on your own. Uh, you need to reuse the work that's done by the Linux distros like Debian and Red Hat and Ubuntu all are doing CVE tracking and you should try and leverage that work and use the information that they've gathered. Yocto Project, if you're using that for your builds, also has a tool that's integrated already. Uh, if you add uh, this to your local configuration file in Eric plus equals CVE check, then you'll get some additional uh, CVE checking uh, as part of your Yocto builds. So the tools are improving. Uh, there's still a lot of false positives in kernel CVE reporting. It's, it's pretty hard work. Uh, writing the code to reproduce these vulnerabilities and, and test for them. Um, and so you know, it's, 
really important that as an industry we share the work of reporting and fixing the bug. There's no way that a single person or a single organization uh, could fix all of the different bugs that get reported every year. <coughs> so uh, this was, a, uh, I thought, a useful talk. Another, another talk I went to was talking about testing laboratory API. You'll see a theme uh, to my sessions. The sessions, I went to a lot of testing sessions because that's what I'm interested in lately. Uh, but this was a talk by a, uh, a developer from Samsung talking about uh, the slob testing stack. Uh, they had created a custom board called the MuxPy uh, that uh, they used in their labs to uh, take over some of the hardware tasks and board management. Uh, but the main thrust of this talk was about creating a modular uh, continuous integration stack. Um, and they said that uh, doing this resulted in smaller, more maintainable modules, each of which could be used independently, and they said it was a really important. Uh, in-house CI systems, every company has an in-house CI system, uh, but they can't keep up with community CI systems. If you write it in a monolithic fashion, you'll really find yourself in a dead end. And so you should try to be modular so that you can reuse features that the community is working on. Um, and Samsung actually published the code for their slob stack, and so they're hoping to uh, have people use their software as, as well as uh, use other people's software. Uh, so that was good. Uh, the next session uh, that I want to talk about is open source license variations in Linux and Android. This was not an ELC session. Uh, this was uh, from the open source summit. I think it was might have been on the legal track, but anyway, or the licensing track. Uh, this shows the results of an exhaustive analysis of license text in the kernel. And not surprisingly, there are lots of minor text variations. Uh, and some of them causing all kinds of um, interesting problems for uh, code that goes in and, and does license management. So there were uh, one of the industry initiatives, it's called SPEX. There were SPEX people that were in the room and there was a good discussion about the remedies for this type of thing. So companies are trying to be conscientious, they're trying to be uh, careful with how they manage the licenses, and having all these kind of weird uh, licenses that have been poorly worded or have had sections removed or added uh, gives them a lot of grief. Uh, not being a lawyer, uh, I said we should just go in and fix the text. Just change the license. <laughs> uh, people in the room said that was a bad idea. Uh, but anyway, uh, so you don't want you not allowed to change the intent of someone's license. Uh, but some of them were pretty clear cut, just you know, typographical errors and things like that. Um, I went to a session on Toybox. Uh, it's a project that I've been interested in for a while. Uh, Rob Landley was a former BusyBox maintainer, and BusyBox, of course, is used uh, very extensively in the embedded uh, field as a multi-tool. Uh, uh, utility suite, um, but he talked about why he started the Toybox project and uh, some of the motivation behind that. A lot of it had to do with licensing issues. He, he was actually at uh, Cisco when the as he was a BusyBox maintainer, maintainer working at Cisco when uh, other developers in BusyBox sued Cisco uh, over, and so that left kind of a bad taste in his mouth. He, uh, he didn't like that. Uh, anyway, so Toybox is actually uh, pretty successful now. It is now the default multi-tool in Android. Uh, so it's been shipped in uh, probably uh, at least hundreds of millions, if not billions of phones, uh, or over a billion anyway. It's uh, mostly done. Uh, all of the important bits that were needed to make it useful for Android have already been done. There's always uh, kind of tweaks and commands that could be improved. Uh, so there are a few things still in progress. To get around this problem with the license, Rob invented actually a new license called the Zero BSD license. It's like it's like the Berkeley software distribution license, BSD license, uh, which comes in several different flavors: a, a three clause Berkeley license or a four clause Berkeley license. He tried to Rob went the other way and actually simplified it even more and made something that they call the Zero BSD license. He tried to do the simplest license possible, uh, basically having a license on the code but trying to achieve public domain status. And uh, the license is actually available as an option on GitHub, so he was fairly successful in creating a new license. 
uh, pretty interesting. And that's the license, obviously, that Toybox is under. So there's, uh, if you look at reasons to use Toybox, um, it's got a very, very simple development environment. Uh, it has a lot of less legacy stuff than BusyBox. It's a newer project, so there's uh, a lot less crap lying around in it. Um, uh, there's help text for every command. Uh, Rob claims that it's got better PS, LS, UU, and code implementations uh, that's easier to contribute to. Uh, but probably the number one reason is the license clarity. So uh, some people are not happy with BusyBox being GPL, so Google was one of them. Uh, so they never included BusyBox in Android. But uh, there's no possibility of legal issues using the code. It's as close to public domain as you can get. So, uh, so that's something worth checking out. Uh, another session I went to was by some uh, Sony developers uh, creating a Bluetooth pan USB R and disk router. So they started, uh, the main thrust of this was using NutX for extending a router uh, for use with low-end hard hardware. So they started with an open WRT-based WRT router. So this is a Linux-based router. So this is why it's, uh, it's appropriate for a embedded Linux conference. Um, and they added Bluetooth pan support, and they added RN disk support. Uh, these are options that are available inside, existing in the open router, open WRT system, but they uh, showed how to do that. And then once they had that support in the router, they showed a bunch of interesting things you could do uh, with a NetX-based device. So a very low-end system, a system that's not capable of running Linux. They talked about how you could add Bluetooth support in NetX, RN to support, um, wireless networking support, and to prove that they could actually do some useful things, interesting useful things, they actually ported the Alexa SDK to NetX. So they could do some voice control, uh, music demos. They did, demonstrated a lot of this using uh, uh, the networking that they added to a Sony uh, Spresen support. So uh, that was a pretty interesting talk. Uh, I'm not that familiar with the networking stuff, but I learned quite a bit in that talk. Um, and then the last talk I was able to get to was called USB Arsenal for the NASA's. Uh, this was a very good introduction to USB. Basically, talked about a lot of different tools for sniffing uh, and tracing USB. Uh, so there's tools that are that have been in the kernel for a long time, like USB Mod, and they talked about uh, fuzzing tools for doing testing and other like hardware tools, uh, something called USB Proxy that uh, you can in insert between the two endpoints of the USB to actually do hardware tracing, and how you could integrate USB monitor with Wireshark, uh, which is a very common network packet tracing tool. Uh, Samsung has really been focused on USB testing lately, uh, particularly on USB security testing. Um, and they actually uh, introduced a new USB fuzzing framework uh, based on concept from uh, another fuzzing framework very heavily used in the community called syscaller. Uh, anyway, you can read about uh, this, uh, all, all of the tools that they did. Uh, if you're interested at all in USB and you need to debug it or you need to test it, then uh, very highly recommend this talk. So, and then the last session uh, that uh, was, I, I guess you could say I attended it, it was the one I presented, it was, it was the clothing game. And I just had to uh, throw in a few of my own favorite. Uh, so this is the trivia game that we do at the end of the conference. So I want each of you, uh, you get to cl play this game, at least two questions of this game, and see if you know the answers to these. So uh, what is your opinion? Has Linux been to another, another planet? How many people say no, it has not? I'm watching. I'm going to see if you guys raise your hand. Okay, how many people think, yes, Linux has been to another planet? Raise your hand if you think so. And the answer is, yes, it has been. And that is, uh, so you're correct if you raised your hand. Uh, Linux has recently been to Mars. Uh, it was put in some microsatellites. Uh, Ubuntu, uh, no, it was a Yonka project. Yonka project uh, based system was uh, installed on some micro, satellites that were launched all the way to Mars. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. This is the first time Linux has actually left uh, Earth. It's in SpaceX rockets, but SpaceX so far has not been out of low Earth orbit. Um, okay, and then the second question, this is just for fun. Does the US military program have a, the US military have a program called Skynet? Who thinks that's true? Raise your hand. 
Because who, who think that's false? I'm just making that up. Because it's true. Are looking to the US, the US military has a program called Canada Skynet. Itself. So if you don't know, Skynet is the uh, operating system that, or the, the overall system, artificial intelligence system in, ter in the Terminator movie series. So it's a fictional movie series, but only the US military would think it was a good idea to name one of their programs after a, uh, an AI that ended up destroying the world and trying to kill all of humanity. So that was kind of funny. Um, so if you were unable to go to uh, ELC, uh, luckily we put all of the resources online. So the presentations, like I said, most of the presentations are available online. The videos were actually published. Uh, there's a long story about some of the issues going on with the video. Uh, they, the Linux Foundation thought it would be a good idea to make them free for attendees, but then charge non-attendees for them, but we said we didn't like that. The community had a pretty strong negative response to that. So right now the videos are available on Vimeo, and there's actually a pay button, but there's also a free button, so anyone can go there and see them for free. Uh, but they're actually just going to, Linux Foundation is backpedaling, and they're just going to put all of the videos on YouTube. Uh, so we're waiting until that happens just so that, because that's going to be the final resting place. We're going to get the links added to the wiki page. So if you wait uh, probably a week or two, I think for sure by October 8th, we're supposed to have the uh, videos uploaded to YouTube. So there was lots of really great in-depth technical content at ELC. So all kinds of stuff, you know, I, I stayed on kind of some high level topics, uh, but there was all kinds of uh, good stuff about the kernel under doing sensors, IIO, USB, uh, PWN, which is full width modulation LED subsystem, uh, graphics, uh, stuff about Yocto, so lots and lots of great stuff. So, and it's all freely available, so if any of this looks interesting for your own uh, products, then uh, please make sure you go use it. Okay, so switching gears completely to hot maintainer topics. So one of the things that happens every summer is as we start gearing up for the kernel summit, uh, there's a dis there are discussions that start happening on something called the K summit discuss mailing list. So uh, K summit discuss is used every summer to discuss process issues with Linux. Uh, arguably, the the goal of the mailing list is to figure out what sessions to discuss in person. But what happens is uh, every summer people decide that some people some things should be hashed out on the list before talking about them face to face. And it's basically improving process issues, so a lot of maintainer issues. Now, some of these issues don't end up affecting uh, end users or contributors very much, but it, but um, but some do, and some are pretty interesting. <clears throat> so there are three issues that I kind of saw that were interesting. The change ID uh, thread was very long, for hundreds of messages. Email is the main main review method and patch transport and maintainer profile. So I'll talk about those real quick. So there was a proposal made to add a change ID field to patches and particular patch series. And this is to track patches over their lifetime uh, as they go from email to Git. And this is something apparently that Garrett does. I'm not that familiar with Garrett, uh, which is uh, kind of Google's uh, code review um, patch management system. Uh, but there were a lot of objections to this particular field. Linus Torvalds actually got involved. You don't see him chime up very often on some of these things, but he did on this one. He said that an arbitrary uh, ID was not that valuable because you really had to have the system that generated it in order to get the value out of it. And so uh, he, he provided some alternatives. Other people also survived, provided some alternatives. So they're not saying that the, the use case is not important. It's not it, it's still, they, they're agreeing with the premise that it's valuable to track patches over their lifetime and see how they evolve and, and be able to go back and, and uh, use them. But they suggested to use the link tag and, uh, and have some tools to manage that instead of a new change ID or a UUID. And it turned out that some developers were already, already using uh, the link tag and the link well, this is the link tag specifically is intended to be a link to the email messages that are related to that tag or that commit. And uh, some developers already had tools to manage that. So um, there's a whole article uh, about that thread. So this is an interesting thing. But 
the thing that I learned from this that I, I guess I should have known beforehand is uh, there is a su system for archiving messages from kernel subsystem mailing lists. Make sure that they all have unique uh, message IDs. Um, so each list, and this is not just for LKML, it's for any any subsystem mailing list can ask request to be added to the list of archived messages. And so a kernel commit message can have a link to uh, a mailing list message very easily. So this is a very handy cross-reference uh, from the commits uh, back to the patches in email form, and then you can go back and see the discussions related to them. And uh, there are already some tools that create link tags for you, and there's uh, a lot of link tags already in mainline kernel commit messages. There's over 1,800 already. Um, and uh, part of the discussion was someone actually during the discussion went and added support in Git K to follow the link. So if you're using Git K with uh, the kernel Git repository, you can now just click on the links inside the user interface. And I think other systems that do code management probably get help will support that as well. Um, so this was something I learned that is already existing, and I think this is probably going to end up solving the problem that uh, that one developer raised. Uh, another another discussion topic that came up was about how bad email is as a way to manage patches. So the problem is that all the maintainers have their existing workflows heavily, heavily based on uh, email. In particular, a lot of them are using MUT, and the way that MUT does threading, and the way that they can uh, retrieve the emails uh, and save them offline, and then get on a plane and review a whole bunch of patches while they're on a plane, and then connect back up and, and send out all the responses. Uh, so the offline, the ability to do offline work is really, really uh, valuable to the community. And it scales better than other other things. Um, but even that said, uh, a bunch of developers are not happy with email uh, for handling patch reviews. Um, and so Konstantin uh, Ryevintsev uh, posted a description of what he thought would be a uh, requirements or a description of how a tool would work that was not based on email uh, that used a different mechanism. Uh, so that it was more accessible to contributors. Uh, Jan Nicola also raised the possibility of, uh, of uh, doing, uh, supporting Git email as a review mechanism for all developers, but actually making it so the contributors did not have to mess with email. So, and this was actually discussed, uh, rediscussed at the Maintainer Summit in, in Portugal, and they have created a new mailing list for continuing discussions of this called workflows at future.kernel.org. So if you're interested in this, the reason I the reason I talk about this is this does not just apply to maintainers. Uh, this is actually really important for contributors. If you have ideas for how to make it easier for contributors uh, to contribute to the kernel, please join that list and you know watch what's going on and, and make your own comments. Um, one. Uh, I think Jan said something that was interesting. He said, we always talk about how many contributors we have, but how, how much time do we spend making the contributors' life easier as opposed to the maintainers' life easier? Granted, maintainers have to deal with a lot more uh, bandwidth in terms of messages, and so we, do concern, we are concerned about uh, how efficient they are, but we should also be concerned with the efficiency of contributors. Um, and then the other thing that came up was a uh, resurrection of an idea from last year called maintainer profile documents. And again, this is this is kind of for maintainers. It's it's an idea that affects maintainers, but it also affects contributors. So the idea is to document the policies of maintainers that are unique to their subsystems, hopefully aggregating lots of data and pointing out outliers. So the types of information that they want to document is when do you accept patches? You know, what on what RC version is kind of your cutoff point? Uh, can what is your review policy? What what types of tests do you run? To, and uh, how, are you available twenty four seven, or you know, are you only available certain days of the week? All kinds of issues that um, that a newcomer, if a newcomer comes into uh, a new subsystem, each subsystem has its own so maintainer with a little bit of their own rules. And so this is to document all those different rules to make it easier for contributors. So actually the goal of this is not really to make the maintainer's life easier, it's to make the contributor's life easier. And there's a whole maintainer guide that's being developed um, that uh, has the goal of uh, making maintainer's life easier, 
but this maintainer profile is really about them, maintainers giving enough information to contributors to help them uh, have an easy time as well. Okay, so those are some of the hot topics over the summer. We'll see what happens as, uh, as those types of things uh, develop and mature. Hopefully it will get easier in the future to uh, contribute to journal. Okay, so now on to the actual headline item, which is the, my report on the Plumbers Conference. So this was held in Lisbon, Portugal just last week. The last week? Yeah, last, last Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah. Not, not of this week, but the previous week. Uh, so again, I'll talk about the sessions I attended, and, and including the, oh, uh, that's the, the Dmitry Bukov, that's supposed to be a you know, bombshell talk, uh, and then some material from the containers. From it. So Plumbers was really big this year in, in terms of uh, areas that it covered. So, uh, they have to put a cap on the attendees uh, because they only have so much capacity in the venues they go to. But they have 18 micro conferences going. Uh, you can see them listed here. So it's like just, there's just a ton of uh, content at this conference. I imagine uh, it's three days and, and multiple tracks per day of all, all kinds of different stuff, as well as the Colonel Summit and the Maintainer Summit all held at once. So some of the sessions I attended, uh, in particular, in terms of microconferences, I got to the distribution kernels micro microconference and the testing fuzzing microconference. And then the sessions, I had a lot of stuff, obviously, having to do with distribution kernels and with testing. So monitoring, stabilizing the in-kernel ABI, kernel CI applied to distribution kernels. Uh, you can read these. Uh, here's a bunch more sessions I went to, but I'm going to go through each of these in detail. So a lot of really interesting concepts came up. So at the monitoring and stabilizing the internal ABI, uh, this was an interesting presentation by Google, Google about how to keep LPS kernels ABI stable. Apparently, uh, sometimes uh, when patches are backported to the stable kernel releases, they will actually break the ABI, which means that if you have binary drivers, um, uh, theoretically, if you have a binary driver for something on your phone, uh, proprietary module or something, the ABI in the kernel will actually break uh, just because of a back pack that was backported. And so it makes it so that uh, Google and other Linux vendors have to be very careful about applying patches. They have to check every patch that they apply, even if it's from the stable brand. So Google has been working to try to create stability at least within a, per a single release. Now, the Linux community has always said that they reserve the right from release to release to change the ABI. Uh, but, you know, the argument here, and actually Greg Crow Harper was in the room, and he agreed with this, is that within a single release, the ABI really should be stable. Uh, so they're using something that, uh, they created a tool that checks for function signatures and data structure changes to make sure that um, new patches don't, don't break those types of things. They're using a library called libabigail, um, and uh, on a personal note, I think this would be really, really useful to incorporate into the embedded CI loop, or the CI loop for embedded products, uh, to avoid having backported patches break ABI for products. And this would include patches grabbed from the stable tree, as well as patches that uh, your product developers use, uh, come up with to fix issues for your product. Uh, you just don't want to break the ABI, you, or you want to detect that if the ABI ever changes due to a change uh, in your product development cycle. Um, another talk I went to was kernel CI applied to distribution kernels. So kernel CI is a uh, continuous integration test framework that works on upstream kernels. Uh, so it's been, for the longest time, it's only been testing pop-up trees. Uh, and this presentation was about what are the features needed to be able to test downstream kernels, so distribution kernels like Red Hat, and, uh, SUSE, and Debian all have their own kernels, um, and, and including a potential Yocto project kernel. Uh, so obviously you need distribution, uh, you need the kernel headers that go along with that distribution uh, in order to build tests against the right kernel. And there are actually a bunch of user space dependencies uh, that are required in order to to build the test software correctly. Uh, it would be nice to have a make distro feature that was actually part of the kernel make tree, so that, that was a very interesting uh, uh, feature that was requested. And some of the distribution people really thought that would be nice. 
I don't know if it's possible, but it would, it would be nice. Um, and then uh, I think this is also very relevant for embedded kernels because we have the same problem. That we, we would really like to be able to run these like, continuous integration systems on our kernels that are pretty far from upstream, uh, often three or four, three to five years behind upstream. And it'd be nice to be able to leverage the same testing tools. Um, um, so the next talk was really about Gen2 testing. Um, and uh, Gen2 is a source distribution, so it's kind of been not in the same category as some of the binary distributions like Debian and Red Hat, but uh, this presentation was about what they were doing. Some of the interesting notes I took, um, Gen2 is currently using a tool called BuildBot, but they want to switch over to, I guess, what we would consider the, the um, industry, what, what what is becoming the de facto industry standard is lava for board management, kernel CI for um, continuous integration on the kernel. And so this is kind of a compliment to the previous talk, but uh, so, something I heard in this talk, which wasn't part of the presentation, but it's part of the discussion in the room, was Red Hat uh, was using Jenkins uh, as part of their thing, but they found that they spent a whole bunch of time managing Groovy scripts, and uh, they thought that was not the best use of their testing time. So this, this has kind of hit a chord with me because Fuego, the test system that I maintain, actually uses Jenkins, so I found their comments kind of interesting. Uh, in Fuego, we've been actually trying to separate some of the Fuego modularity from, from Jenkins. So interesting to see other people having the same issues that we have. Um, Kernel CI also gave a separate talk on uh, how they manage the hardware testing and just uh, the, a lot of the things that they're doing. So uh, this was a basic introduction to kernel CI and how much testing they're doing. It's a lot. They have uh, hundreds of boards now distributed in uh, lots of different labs. Uh, and they're now branching out. They Historically, they were only focused on boot testing. They're just trying to make sure that our, originally, the whole all idea of kernel CI was to make sure that ARM boards could still boot every kernel release. And it was surprising how many failed. So now that they kind of have uh, got that, um, they've got that testing down and it's working pretty well, they decided to branch into subsystem specific runtime tests. So instead of just boot testing, they want to test actual features of the kernel, uh, in particular hardware features. So the intention is to actually end up being people being used as the gatekeeper for a subsystem acceptance boot patch. So what that means is they want a maintainer, like say at the media subsystem, to be able to say, okay, Kernel CI, run, use my tree uh, before it's even integrated in the next. Go run a bunch of tests for me and tell me if my tree is okay right now. And so, uh, instead of just looking at the at the top of tree, uh, they're now getting into maintainers uh, in the sub subsystem trees, uh, which is hopefully going to be here very helpful. So they have to onboard each subsystem test very manually and very laboriously, um, and then. Part of the onboarding process is needing to customize notifications to subsystem maintainers. Okay, so another testing text. Sorry, sorry about this. Uh, dealing with complex test suites. Uh, this was a talk about actually uh, the kernel CI people want to standardize the elements of the test pipeline. One of one of the examples they talked about is uh, get by section. So every every one of the test frameworks wants to be able to do get by section so they can figure out. Once they've determined a problem, figure out where, if, see if they can narrow it down to the actual commit that introduced the problem. But it's a very difficult problem. Bisection is a difficult problem, and people have, people have been out there, and several different groups have tried to solve the same problem. And so uh, Kernel CI got, guys did it, and they have, a, they have a new bisection tool called Scalpel, which is more, uh, they claim is more, uh, more efficient and more effective at bisecting things. They're actually working on the next generation of that uh, tool called KCI Bisect um, to hopefully uh, make this uh, better. Um, a new, okay, so now, not not a uh, testing feature per se, but a, a memory, uh, memory well, kind of testing. So there's something called GWP ASAN. Uh, I know the ASAN stands for Address Sanitizer. Uh, so this is a new pointer checking feature. So it turns out that there's a lot of bugs in the kernel having to do with uh, uh, out of bounds, using, using a pointer out of bounds, 
uh, and then uh, using a, ref, a pointer after the memory has been free for the object that was, under, uh, that was used or allocated. And so there's uh, systems that already existed called like electric fence and others, uh, KSAN, kernel address sanitizers, that add guard pages and perform checks on every access. But the problem is that nobody turns these on in production systems. Uh, because they degrade the performance very badly. So basically on every reference, um, well, in every allocation, you have to add extra pages uh, to every object in the system, so it uses a ton of extra memory, um, and uh, you have to uh, check references, and it degrades performance substantially. So the, uh, the key idea of this new system is that it does the same types of checks, but rather than do it on every piece of memory, it does it on some subset of the memory. Like something like oh, less than 1%, like 0.1% of the memory gets checked. But if you're Google and you're using Linux at scale, uh, this is eventually going to uncover the same memory bugs. You don't have to look at every memory allocation or put up the guard pages and uh, perform checks on every access. Uh, you can do it on 0.1% of the accesses and still find the bugs. And so the idea is that the overhead is low enough that you can turn these checks on even in production hardware. Uh, and so that's what they're striving for. So this is something that may find a lot of uh, bugs and improve uh, the quality of the uh, kernel memory allocation. Uh, there is a whole talk on uh, uninitialized memory. Turns out there's a lot of bugs in the kernel having to do with using memory. Uh, and assuming it's been zeroed when it hasn't been. Uh, so there's a new mechanism called uh, kernel memory sanitizer. They've already found 150 bugs, and are, uh, 42 have already been fixed. And they've added um, uh, they've added some new configuration options, some new, and are using compiler options for pre-initialized memory. And there's also some new boot time flags, a knit on alloc and a knit on free, which will uh, actually perform initialization of the memory to protect you against some bugs in this area. Um, and then another one was about SysBot. Now SysBot is an automated testing tool that runs a system called SysCaller, uh, which is a, a syscall buzzer buzzing test framework. Uh, and this SysBot has found thousands of bugs. Um, they've reported, uh, they've reported, so they found approximately I think over 20,000 bugs. Uh, they've reported uh, 2,200 of them. Uh, they've fixed 1,500 of them. They still have 758 open. So this is kind of bad news. We're finding a lot of bugs in the kernel. Uh, but the good news is we're finding a lot of bugs in the kernel. Uh, and uh, so this test was pretty interesting. It recommended that all test frameworks test with KMM leak and fault injection. That's one of the secrets to them finding so many bugs. Um, and uh, they, when they find a bug, obviously the same type of thing, they try to do bisection, uh, but this is a very hard thing. They find out they only have about a 50% success rate. So if they find a bug, they know there's a bug in the main nine kernel, but they are only 50% of the time can they actually go back and bisect it. One of the reasons for that is that the, um, as you go back in kernel versions, there are things that are missing uh, that cause it so that your, your test program that needs to run against the kernel uh, doesn't work. So there's things like missing k-build rules, difference in the way the Perl versions handle things, uh, missing make features and kernel config changes. And so a whole, yeah, a whole list of things. So SysBot is finding tons and tons of bugs, but it still could be improved. Um, uh, then there was a talk on collaboration and unification around unit testing frameworks. And there's a test framework called KUnit that just got added to the Linux kernel, and another one called KTF uh, that wants to reuse some of the same concepts. And unless you're a testing person, you're probably not as interested as, as I am. So K self tests, uh, Shua Khan uh, talk, who's the maintainer here, she talked about uh, K self tests and all the areas. There are about 70 test areas with multiple test programs per area and multiple test cases per program. So there's a lot of questions about being able to make K self test uh, usable in a lot more environments. Right now, it's really used, that intended to be used by a single developer at their desk as they're working on the top of the tree. 
but we, it'd be much nicer if end users could also test it. And so one of the discussion topics was making a binary package that the distros could actually include. So any end user could run K self test just by doing a, a package install and running the tests. And then K self test, actually a lot of the tests require that certain big options are turned on. So this is, this is, uh, won't work with production kernels. Production kernels have a fixed set of big options and uh, most end users are not going to recompile their kernel. If you're an Android user, you're not recompiling your kernel with a bunch of extra config options turned on. Um, and so KSF developers are now currently working on better skip logic and better handling of uh, uh, kernels that do not have the correct config or do not uh, have the right version. One of the biggest issues that came up was whether or not you could run KSF test from top of tree with older kernels. So for instance, uh, 5.3 kernel was just released. It's got a whole bunch of self-tests that are in the source code now. Uh, but if you're an embedded developer and you're running like a 4.4 kernel or a 4.9 kernel, um, those tests, actually a lot of them won't compile uh, and they won't run. And uh, if you stick with just running the the case self test that was available at the time of the 4.4 release, you have very, very small coverage. So uh, the LKFT project, which is a Lenaro testing project for the kernel, they uh, did a lot of research in this area and uh, uh, they gave a bunch of stats on how effective it is to run these tests. Uh, when you run the top of tree K self test with the old kernel, you get that good test coverage, but you get a lot of false positives. And so there's a lot of work to be done to fix that up. And uh, hopefully that'll happen in the future. Uh, the other thing I went to, just because I'm, a, uh, I'm an embedded developer who likes fast boot stuff, was uh, a, a talk on fast booting. So Intel was able to reduce kernel boot time from about three seconds to 0.3 seconds. And this was to uh, be able to get a rear view camera in an automobile up as soon as you turn the key on, uh, or within 0.3 seconds. And they saw a whole bunch of things. If you're interested in, in boot time reduction, this is a, is a really good talk. They talked about all of the uh, things that they had to do to, uh, to improve the system. One of the things that was kind of shocking was they actually uh, they didn't replace system B, but they uh, completely, but they started with a different init system, a lightweight init as their root initialization system because system D was taking too long. Um, and they also saw a lot of big improvements with asynchronous programming. They found a lot of uh, things that as they're initializing in the Linux kernel uh, get um, uh, stop and do a serial synchronous probe of some hardware. And there's actually a feature already in the kernel called probe prefer asynchronous, uh, but it, you have to actually put it into the source code to do that. Um, and once you put it into the source code, you really need to test it thoroughly to make sure that it, that it works because it's not on by default and so there's a lot of opportunity for bugs or for race conditions during booting or not. Uh, but they said that they, that was probably the single biggest thing that allowed them to uh, get good boot performance. Uh, so they tried to add some more tunables, uh, which is like new config options to the kernel that individuals could tweak, but the kernel developers uh, don't like more config options shut down on that. And then finally, I saw a brand new system that I haven't seen before, which is called CKI. Uh, CKI is a Red Hat, Red Hat Distribution Kernel Tester. Uh, stands for Continuous Kernel Integration. It was based on an old in-house test system. And this, this system has actually been around for a long time, but it, uh, Red Hat is finally uh, just deciding to publish it and make it available to outsiders. Um, so they had a couple of really interesting features. Um, but each test has a maintainer who's responsible for managing and detecting failures. That sounds like kind of a no-brainer, but that's actually a real big problem in testing. Uh, there's a lot of test systems that a uh, test will run, a result is generated, um, you know, a failure is reported by the test system, but there's no human assigned to actually go uh, work on the fix. And, and sometimes that involves fixing the test, and sometimes it involves actually going in and debugging and fixing the kernel. Uh, it's, they've already fixed many bugs upstream so far, but they're just getting started. Um, and uh, one of the things that was really interesting is that for each of their tests, they have a description 
of the source code that's related to that test. So that allows them to schedule a test based on the source affected by a patch. So for instance, a patch comes in, uh, and I think they're the only system I've seen that can do this. A patch comes into the Linux kernel and say it affects the networking subsystem. Well, they can actually identify what pieces of software uh, that, uh, that that patch touches and then go look at their tests and say, well, we only need to run these tests because these, these tests are the ones that cover that, that piece of software. Um, and so that allows them to do much more intelligent scheduling of tests, uh, which is important if you want to test at scale. Um, and they have enough information to reproduce the test later, which is another nice feature. Um, so, and I think that may be the last testing talk. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, fine, I went to a science talk because uh, I'm also, since I'm a embedded guy, I look at science stuff. So um, embedded systems are always running out of RAM just because they, have, they don't have enough. They never have enough. Uh, so this is a talk by Google about a crazy system to reclaim idle app memory. Uh, so it reclaims memory at runtime instead of at killing process, instead of killing processes at boom time. Uh, so it has a whole system for detecting what it considers to be idle memory. Uh, it created a new syscall called Process M Advise um, that a user space uh, program can use to indicate idle memory. Um, and in their own experimentation, like the, I think their biggest success story was they had a popular game that was using 1.8 gig of memory uh, that was allocated. Uh, but after reclaim, they ran their thing found some that it, a lot of the memory was idle uh, and was able to keep the game in the background using only 700 meg physical RAM. So this is, uh, there's a lot of details in this talk that you should look at if you're interested in, in uh, reducing uh, user space for memory usage. But um, one of the things they discovered, discovered is that it requires uh, tuning for good performance. Uh, so one of the things they did is uh, in order to categorize the memory as idle, you have to have a lot of tunable parameters. They found with a two-minute idle categorization, they could, most applications showed up with about 32% idle memory, uh, about 14% of which can be reclaimed. So this is a, a work in progress. It's not upstream, but it's very interesting. Um, and uh, how's my, how's my, are you still be able to hear me okay? My, Okay, and then the K-Unit testing framework. And uh, this was, uh, K-Unit was just barely added to Linux 5.4. It was in the next tree at the time of this event, but 5.3 came out and, and that is gonna get pulled in in this merge window. Uh, this is a new unit testing framework. It's part of K-Self-Test. Uh, it runs very, very fast. It can boot the code in, uh, boots the code under test in UML and can run multiple tests in seconds. Uh, so this is really for white box testing of the kernel for uh, maintainers to be able to see that their uh, infrastructure has not changed. They haven't broken something horribly in their inside their own systems. This is based on a, a very elaborate system from Google that has additional features such as mocking uh, interfaces to other modules. Uh, this is integrated into case self test and for example, it produces tap output as part of its result format. So it can be integrated into other people's CI systems very easily. Um, and then the last talk, which I went to, and the last talk that was uh, very, very big news at the conference was uh, a talk called Reflections on Kernel Quality. And this is what we refer to as a bombshell talk. So there's a developer from Google, uh, Dmitry Bukov, who has been studying the kernel bugs. And uh, based on his research, uh, more bugs are going into the kernel than we are fixing every release. He said every release of the kernel, by his estimation, has 20,000 new bugs. And uh, he had actual data to back up this claim, and it's a very frightening claim. If, it, if it's true, it means the kernel is uh, headed for some kind of uh, crisis in terms of bug management. Um, and he had a whole bunch of uh, uh, kind of recommendations, a bunch of criticism basically of kernel processes, talking about how they're fragmented and a lot of, a lot of times flawed. And he had a list of recommendations. The top was uh, so um, 
interesting, I guess is the best word, that they decided to reschedule it and, and have it again the next day so he could tell more people about uh, what he found. So this was actually given twice, once at Plumbers and then once at the Maintainer Summit. So, and there's an LWN.net article that talks about uh, this talk, so um, I think a lot of people will be talking about this talk for a while uh, based on some of his uh, research and some of his recommendations. Um, if you want to see the resources for plumbers, um, some of, a lot of the talks are not actually uploaded yet, which is really disappointing. Uh, but you can find some of the talks are already online. If you go to the overview page and then go into the schedule, uh, the slides are supposed to be associated with the schedule. I don't know when the videos will be made available, but there were videos made of every uh, session. And then a lot of the sessions had either pads, which means that uh, they were intended to be discussion sessions and people were taking notes. And particularly there was an ether pad for the entire testing and buzzing uh, microconference. So that's really good because you can get to see the comments from developers and the discussions in the room that happened while the session was going on. Okay, that's it for plumbers. So I know that was kind of long. Sorry for how long that was. Next one was the CKI Hackfest, which I'm going to go a little bit faster over. But this was held in, also in Lisbon. Uh, this was sponsored by Red Hat. Uh, and this was, uh, again, really about uh, their system, the continuous kernel integration, but they, uh, they're they wanting to join the community of upstream testing groups. So now they're, they're actually listed about seven groups that are doing upstream testing of uh, the top of Tree Linux kernel. The three main ones that are producing a lot of bugs and a lot of, uh, providing a lot of value are SysBot, Zero Day, Kernel CI, and, and the Red Hat people, uh, like I said, are just announcing CKI now to the world and pushing it out there. And they want to join that group and make sure that they're using best practices, maybe reusing work from each other. So there are a lot of groups represented at this Hackfest, the Lenaro, Fuego, Kernel CI, IBM was there, Red Hat, uh, Google with their SysBot was there, and OpenXT. A lot of topics were discussed. I'm not, I'm not going to go into all of it, but one of the most interesting things was they talked about a common results repository, so all these different CI systems, they want to have them feed into a single location. Um, and they actually, during the Hackfest, they created a BigQuery database instance, uh, which BigQuery is a, a Google service that allows you to do free uh, data publication, uh, similar to a database, not exactly, but uh, anyway. And so they actually wrote some clients during the Hackfest, so it really was a Hackfest. Uh, they talked about avoiding duplication of effort, trying to use common hardware pools, and one of the things they're going to try to do is see if they can actually share hardware between labs. So for instance, kernel CI or SysBot could run tests on the, in the CKI lab, which is actually, their board layer is called Beaker. And then CKI could run jobs in a lava lab, which is the kernel CI board here. So they want to see if they can actually start uh, crossing boundaries. They also talked quite a bit about notification reporting. One of the biggest issues that they want to solve is they don't want to have seven different C uh, automated testing systems all giving different types of messages into the kernel, or even worse, giving duplicate reports to maintainers. If maintainers start getting seven or eight reports for the same bug, uh, they'll just go crazy and they won't listen anymore. And so they discussed what it was that upstream maintainers want. They talked about how to uh, use the same types of formats um, and about the problems with onboarding tests was kind of part of that discussion. Um, and so uh, the other thing was interpreting results. Uh, it turns out that a lot of companies are turning to machine learning uh, to actually analyze the patterns of the bugs and try to classify certain types of bugs automatically and to find kind of harder to reproduce bugs automatically. And then the last, very last session was on security for untrusted tests. So this is a very, very difficult problem. All of these CI systems want to make it so that uh, and the maintainers can run the test on their hardware. Uh, but this is, they're talking about real hardware, in particular Red Hat's case, they're talking about very expensive hardware, uh, possibly uh, you know, mainframe level hardware. Uh, and that also might happen to be inside Red Hat's corporate firewall. So uh, being able to trust that the test that's going to run is not some Trojan is really, really important. Um, and actually, they, there's already been proof, zero day, uh, someone wrote an exploit uh, that was like a patch that was imported by the zero day test suite. 
and showed that they had uh, that security was lacking. It was actually done as an exercise to see if uh, it could be done. It wasn't. It didn't end up being malicious, but it could have been. And so people are really worried about that. The bottom line of this is that the CI system may not be able to test everything. Uh, there are just some tests they won't be able to test uh, to trust a random patch that comes in off the internet. And so if you're testing a maintainer tree, then at least you know that uh, one set of eyes has been on that code. The maintainer has already done a manual inspection of the code to verify that it's not malicious or, or weird or something. Uh, but uh, it would be a shame if that happened because that would lose a lot of inbound patch testing that people want to do to help the maintainers out to ease the maintainer workload. You really want to, with these CI systems, if you can test before the maintainer even sees it, uh, you're going to catch a lot of stuff and make the maintainer's job easier. Um, so a lot of people took action items. Uh, I had a couple myself. Uh, I'm documenting some stuff in the kernel, working on some test definition metadata and I've been heavily involved in case self testing. Uh, if you want to see the, the, this stuff, the meeting minutes are uh, at this really long URL, uh, but I will publish the, the P, this is all in the PDF, so you can follow that link in the PDF of this talk. And then the proof, proof of concept code is already in GitHub. You can go see how we did the query database. This, this is code that was hacked up during the, during the hack test. Finally, kernel releases, and uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I think I'm, I may be uh, going a little bit over, but I'll, I'm going to zip through the kernel releases. Basically, focus on 5.2 and 5.3. Uh, but here's the here's the picture for kernel releases in the last year. Uh, so uh, we've been having pretty consistent, um, pretty consistent uh, kernel windows, either 63 plus or minus a day or 70 plus or minus a day. Uh, Linux 5.3 just came out uh, 15th of September, that was last Sunday, um, and so we're actually in the 5.4 merge window now, probably see an RC1 on Sunday, uh, oh no, not on Sunday, it'd be a week from Sunday, anyway, uh, but anyway, so kernel processes, they're actually kind of boring now, uh, they're the same, same every time. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all this, I've done it before, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that happened in the kernels leading up to this. That uh, I apologize if you if if you've been coming to the uh, jamborees, then you've seen this step up to about five one. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna skim over it. But when I get to five two, I'll start talking about. It. Okay, so Linux five two, some of the new stuff. So uh, ext four supports case insensitive lookups. Uh, there are so a couple of new system calls for file system mounting. Uh, there's support for ARM Molly GPUs and support for something called Field Bus Protocol. Uh, command line options to control speculative execution features. This has to do with security, uh, this whole Spectre meltdown uh, issue. Uh, and then improved support for uh, a new flag in GCC called Implicit Fall Through, which detects uh, case statements that are badly formed. Lots of BPF improvements. Uh, one of the big features in 5.2 is something called pressure stall monitors. Um, and so, uh, again, Google has been doing, this is again by Google, uh, Google has been doing a ton of work having to do with uh, catching memory, out of memory conditions or detecting memory, out of memory conditions and, and dealing with them ahead of time so uh, your device doesn't fall over and break down. So, uh, pressure stall monitors allow user space to detect and respond quickly to memory pressure. Uh, so you can open, a monitor is written in user space, and uh, you can open proc pressure memory and uh, write into that a notification specification. So uh, it indicates what, to the kernel, what frequency to check for stalls, and then what to do about them. So uh, the monitor can then use poll and get these notifications. So when the kernel detects, uh, the kernel has to has to do a bunch of work to scan through memory, and that's why that's why this stuff is uh, highly configurable. Uh, anyway, you provide a the monitor provides a specification to the kernel. The kernel does its memory checking and then uh, issues notifications uh, that can tell in this case Android or whatever, some user space process monitor 
uh, what to do. And this is again, uh, you can detect mounting memory pressure and build processes. So this is a this is not like the other system I was talking about that was uh, reclaiming memory. This is back to killing processes, but it's killing processes before you're out of memory. Uh, the goal is, the idea is that, uh, especially in Android, there's a lot of background processes, or there can be, on the phone, and sometimes if they disappear, the user won't notice. Uh, and it's better to have uh, background processes disappear than the foreground process become sluggish. That's the, that's the thing. So this is a pretty interesting new feature uh, in the Linux kernel. Uh, in Linux 5.3, which just got released on Sunday, uh, we have a, a new feature called uh, PIDFD. Uh, this is a way for um, this is a way for processes to be able to send signals to a, a process uh, and not have something go crazy if, if the PID is reused. So what happens in in a very active system where processes are coming and going? is the process identifier can end up getting reused. And that's bad if someone happens to be sending signals to it. You could end up sending a signal to the wrong process. Um, uh, but PID FD uh, prevents that from happening. Uh, there's a, a, the biggest kind of power feature in this release is scheduler utilization clamping, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, kind of an interesting networking feature is that uh, you can now in the Linux kernel address something on the 0.0.0, .0 network, uh, which is IPv4. So I, as we know, IPv4 addresses are running out. This, the address space um, is almost all used up. Uh, but there's a whole group and a committee that's working on uh, kind of little tweaks and improvements to allow sections of the address space to be reused or used more efficiently. So this actually allows, most of the time, most people would treat 0.0.0, .0 as an invalid network, but uh, uh, it's a perfectly valid network address, uh, and uh, so this allows for 16 million new IPv4 addresses. Okay, so if you're a real-time person, then this next one may shock you, but uh, config preempt RT, the config option has been added to the kernel. So there is a config option, config preempt RT. So the real-time patches for Linux have been out of tree for 20 years now, uh, close, close to 20 years. And we're coming up actually on the last bit getting mainline. Uh, so the final code has not made it in yet, but I am told by people, by very people who would know, i.e. Thomas Leisner himself, that the final bit of preempt RT is gonna be in the 5.4 kernel. Uh, so they actually put the config option into the kernel ahead of the code itself. Uh, so the last bit of code to get preempt RT. Now that doesn't mean preempt RT is done as a feature in the kernel. It'll still require maintenance, but that means that basically you won't have to patch your kernel anymore in order to add real time to it. Uh, so that will, and that should be in about 70 days, 63 or 70 days, you'll have a, a fully real time capable kernel uh, without patches. That's pretty exciting actually. Well, it's exciting for me, I don't know. Um, and then uh, this other thing I talked about is there's these new options for a knit on alloc and a knit on free boot options uh, that pre-initialize memory uh, from the heap so that you uh, can get rid of some uh, uninitialized memory bugs. Um, and then a lot of the, there's a whole ton of features. The best place to go to look at for details on new features for kernel release is kernelnewbies.org. Well, the LWM.net also has really good. So the last thing I want to talk about is scheduler utilization clamping. This is uh, this is an extension to the energy wear of scheduling. Um, and again, this has to do with these foreground background tasks in, in uh, Android or in any embedded product really. Uh, but allows specifying a minimum or maximum frequency for a process. So you what you what you want to do is you want to clamp a user visible or a foreground task some, to some uh, high frequency high minimum frequency. So the frequency can still shuffle around uh, while the task is running, but yeah, you kind of set, uh, you clamped it to a, a, a particular range that is higher than the background task. And then the same thing for background tasks, you would clamp them to a low maximum frequency. So this is not, this is not scheduling. Scheduling frequency is different. Uh, this, this has to do with the frequency that the machine can 
the CPU frequency of the machine uh, that's allowable while a particular process is running. So this helps conserve power while still, still keeping the machine responsive. So it's pretty tricky stuff, uh, but uh, my understanding is it works pretty well. Uh, you can read the LWN.net article for more information. And then the last thing about 5.3 is uh, at the very, very last minute, as part of the, the release, uh, there was a revert of a, a useful patch. And this, is, this was pretty interesting. Uh, because Linus decided he wanted to do a fairly lengthy comment on this. It was probably about 10 paragraphs long. So there was a patch that got added to the 5.3 kernel uh, late in the development cycle, actually. And, uh, well, I don't know where the patch, anyway. But this patch improved EXT performance uh, by a pretty good amount, and it reduced it, the needed disk IOs. Uh, the patch was so good at improving performance that uh, there was not enough disk IOs uh, during the boot process to generate the entropy that's used for the random number generator. So all these systems in the in the Linux kernel are are kind of interrelated. So there was not enough disk IO because the patch was was too performant, I guess. Uh, and the lack of entropy actually caused an end user system to not boot. And it's like, oh well, that's just that's just dumb. Uh, you shouldn't have a boot failure because of lack of entropy. That's kind of silly. Anyway, but the rule, the first rule of kernels is that we don't break end users. It doesn't matter what the reason. Um, so all new end user failures are considered regression. And so people have gone in and tried to figure out, well, what is going on here? Uh, but it was, Linus used it as an opportunity to say, this is how important the first rule is, is that we will even back out performance enhancements that are really, really desirable uh, because we don't break people's systems. Uh, and so that is, so the kernel developers will have to work out how to add new features, uh, add this new feature, the improve the XD performance uh, without going to, I suspect the fix will not be in the file system area. I suspect the fix is gonna be somewhere where in the entropy generator. Um, or it may be a fix that Red Hat rolls out uh, but uh, but anyway, or they may, I don't know, they may fake some entry. I don't know what they're going to do. There have already been three patches, though, to address the, the issues for the next release. But the CXD performance, so probably have to wait a release before it gets out. But that is really, um, that really tells you something about the Linux kernel and how important they see backwards compatibility to have. Just looking back over the uh, contributions, for recent kernels, you can see we've got a steady uh, rate of uh, change sets uh, been going up recently. It's not it's not the highest it's ever been. I think there was a kernel that had 16,000 change sets in it, but it's steadily climbing, and the number of developers for release is kind of going up slowly. We're back in the 1800s. Uh, some kind of interesting stats and in the 5.3 release, there were 256 new contributors, people developers who have never contributed before. If you thought there was no opportunity to become a Linux kernel developer, you are wrong because 256 people just in the last 70 days became kernel developers um, for the first time ever. So there's always opportunity to get involved and start contributing upstream. Um, another really interesting stat is three of the top five reported bylines. So in the commit messages, if, when you fix a bug, you're supposed to say who reported that bug. Well. Uh, out of all of, out of the top five people who reported bugs, three of them were automated testing systems. So that's interesting. So we're getting a lot of bug reports now coming from automated testing systems. Uh, more than the humans are reporting. That's interesting. And then uh, at least 40% of all commits are fixes for bugs. So the way they're measuring that is they're looking for uh, a tag in the commit message that says what, what bug is, it, is this fixing. Um, and so that's that's also interesting. And it's at least 14 percent because a lot of a lot of bug fixes do not have uh, the tag in them. So we're having to fix a lot of stuff that we're breaking. Um, and if you listen to Dimitri, we're breaking more stuff than we're fixing. So interesting. Okay. So just the last little bit of miscellaneous material before before I wrap up here. Uh, in terms of conferences, we have some conferences coming up. I think. Awaitasan, if I understood his Japanese correctly, 
<laughs> they have already talked about some of these. Uh, but uh, ELC Europe coming up in France in October. Automated testing summit is a new new thing for testing. You can tell by the sessions I went to at Plumbers that I'm now a testing guy. Uh, there's the MedEx workshop uh, that uh, also is in um, France. Linuscomp AU is in Australia in January. Positive is in Belgium in February. Um, and then if you if you go to one conference this year, go to Automated Testing Summit. This is what I'm trying to get off the ground. So that's my pitch for it. Um, but next year is going to be interesting. Uh, things are shifting around like crazy. So ELC had is had historically been March, April, May, or March, April, and and it spun all the way out to August this last year for weird reasons that's not worth going into. But it's coming back into the spring, so or springish. So ELC 2020 is going to be in Austin, Texas, in June, and. Open Source Summit Japan has been moving the other way. It started in May, then kind of marched into June. And this year, due to the Summer Olympics uh, that are going to be in Japan next year, it's going to be in September. So uh, Open Source Summit Japan and Automotive Link Summit will be in September. Um, and I don't know if it's going to stay there or not. That's uh, a couple of interesting things in just ter terms of community news. Uh, Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board is changing its election process. I don't know if people care. Uh, people in the community, it used to be that uh, you had to go to a particular conference and you voted by paper. So they're changing both of those things. So this year they changed the paper part of it. So now they're doing election by email, online ballot. Uh, so instead of doing it in person with a paper ballot, you now get an email token that you use to vote online. Next year, the goal is to actually now widen the voting pool to the whole community. Now that they, if once they, they decided to do it in phases, this election chain. So instead of doing a uh, paper ballot, you can't do a paper ballot with the whole community. That doesn't work. We don't even have addresses for the whole community. Um, but uh, the whole entire goal was to get to this next part where they widen the voting pool. Uh, so it used to be that the election was the voting was restricted to attendees at a particular event, and that's not a very good way to represent the entire community. Uh, so in industry news, this is something that was kind of shocking. Richard Stallman uh, uh, just resigned from MIT and the Free Software Foundation and a bunch of other roles he was on. And I don't know enough, I've read some of the reports, but uh, it's hard to know who to trust in terms of what information is what. I did read a couple of things on this. I don't. I don't have enough details to have a strong opinion on the issue that caused Richard's resignation, uh, but I do have a weak opinion. Uh, and that's that it appears to me that some of Richard's messages, um, he, he was discussing a, a, a scandal in the US, and uh, it appears to me that he made an argument that was mischaracterized. Um, and I think he's been misinterpreted. I think that's kind of a shame. Um, and so I, I think that's unfortunate that he's had to resign. Uh, but these, these are the way that politics works sometimes. Um, my overall impression, just one impression I want to give, uh, I have two more, two more issues, both kind of related. Uh, Microsoft, when I was at Plumbers, there were a lot of Microsoft people there. Um, and in fact, Sasha Levin, who is a Microsoft employee and a stable kernel maintainer, was elected to the Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board. So you now have an MS employee who's on a board advising the Linux Foundation. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, so times have really, really changed. Uh, sorry to say, the seat that he got on the, on the board was my seat. <laughs> so I lost my seat on the Technical Advisory Board. Uh, so that's a little bit of a bummer, but these things are somewhat event related. I was elected uh, when they held the elections at the Embedded Linux Conference, so I think I had a lot of people, I guess my embedded people there helped help me get elected. Sasha was elected when the voting was held at Plumbers, and he's he, he's kind of a big fixture at Plumbers, and so anyway, but uh, I think he'll do a great job. Uh, good news is I, I don't have to do a bunch of tab work this year, but uh, bad news is uh, I'd not be able to help out the community by doing some of the stuff on the tab. Uh, related to Microsoft, 
is uh, Microsoft is actually publishing the XFAT specs. So if you're not familiar with this issue, uh, the file system that is used on basically all the SD cards in the world is called the XFAT file system. It's, it's um, anyway, it's a, it's a successor to the FAT file system, which was in DOS and Windows. Uh, but, and Microsoft for years has been charging royalties to use that. They have patents on it. This is really, really interesting that now Microsoft has come out and publicly said they're going to publish the XFAT specs, but they're not going to write the implementation for the kernel, which is weird because you know they've got one. But anyway, so it's kind of hard to read, but they have said publicly that, that they will allow a reference system by the Open Invention Network, OIN, uh, to include XFAT in the kernel. So OIN is a patent pooling uh, group that tries to uh, defend Linux against patents. If, if Microsoft says it's okay for OIN to include XFAT in their reference kernel, that means, I think, no one has said this explicitly, but what that means is that Microsoft will not assert any patents, uh, any of their XFAT patents against Linux users. Now, it may be that the XFAT royalties are about to, or the XFAT patents are about to expire, uh, but I don't, a lot of people have paid Microsoft a lot of money and royalties over that. I mean, I think they were making over a billion dollars a year on that at one point. So, I don't know how much they're giving up, but it's very, very interesting. So, Microsoft is, uh, believe it or not, turning into a friend of Linux. It's, uh, so, that's really interesting. That's one manifestation of it. Um, the last thing, I think this last thing, yeah. So, the kernel CI uh, is becoming a Linux Foundation project. Uh, this started as a Linaro sponsored project, and it kind of turned into a background hobby project for a lot of the companies that were doing it. And now it's going to be actually a Linux Foundation project. It has not formally been announced, but everybody knows it's happening. Uh, people were talking about it openly at Plumbers. Uh, and so, this will actually be formally announced at Embedded Linux Conference Europe. Uh, and people are actually starting to see this as possibly the way to unify all this kernel automated testing. So there's, like I said, there's at least seven different test systems that are now doing reports to maintainers, sending notices and doing automated testing. It'd be nice if we could reduce that. Uh, personally, uh, what this means is I'll be doing a lot more work in FOIA to integrate with some of these common initiatives that are coming up. It means integrating with kernel CI and some of the other uh, pieces of the modular framework that we're trying to put together as an industry. So with that, I will say thank you for your time and apologize for the heavy bias of testing topics. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so are there any questions? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hi, Tom. Uh, <coughs> I, can, uh, I think, yeah, uh, please uh, go, to, uh, go back to your ex, uh, EX part. EX part. Uh, EX I'm part. sorry, I can't hear the question very well. Yeah, uh, could, you, could you back to your EX part? So that's a two, two page part. I don't know. Could you please go back to the yeah. EX part, please? Okay, okay, yeah. Oh. Yeah, this one. So, uh, there is, you said that uh, Microsoft will not uh, provide the, uh, the implementation of their uh, EX part. But uh, I saw uh, the mail uh, from, uh, uh, let's see, uh, actually, that is not. Microsoft, but uh, uh, there is a Microsoft Sasha Ravens uh, signed off by. Uh, there is a the part for uh, uh, staging tree uh, about the EX part implementation. So, did you see an email from Microsoft? So there was there was an EXP an XFAT implementation that was recently submitted to the kernel. And actually, interestingly, it was submitted before this um, before this announcement was made. It was like a month before. I can't remember what month it was. No, uh, it, it same uh, same timing. 
I think. Uh, you, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's our, our, was yeah, that from the, Microsoft though? My my understanding it was wasn't from Microsoft. I could be wrong, and maybe Microsoft is going to do the implementation. But I this, yeah, the seems articles I read said that they were not. Yeah. So I you know. Yeah, it seems that our, uh, Microsoft is involving in this patch set. Uh, because that are uh, yeah actually that the patch is from uh, Greg, but the the uh, author is uh, uh, Validis, which is uh, I think that he's a uh, was a kind of uh, intern uh, student uh, of the Microsoft <laughs> because that are, the, there is a sign of by uh, from uh, uh, Sasha lady yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. So that okay. are, yeah, this seem that are, uh, my, this in, uh, implementation, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft imprint, uh, involving in this uh, yeah. implementation. Well, they could be. Well, I know. Uh, so Sasha Levin is a Microsoft employee, and he actually made some comments on it. So maybe they are going to do some patch review. I don't know. Um, so th th it's very interesting. So this is. This is, of course, not at all related to. There was a patch set where a developer, uh, what did he do? There was some develop, Russian developer that got a hold of Samsung's XFAT implementation and published it uh, yeah. without the permission. Right? That was yeah, like a yeah. couple of years ago. Yeah, that, yeah, so that was. Uh, this is all appears to be legitimate. That one was kind of not legitimate. Right, right. Uh, that is not, uh, yeah. Right, but uh, I think that uh, he uh, called that the uh, implementation is a uh, SD part. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, so I don't know. Do you have any idea how long this will take to get in? I don't. I haven't been following it. I guess that the uh, the current uh, the newer one. So that the uh, this one has a off seem that the official uh, from uh, because that are uh, there is a Sasha signed off by. And the Greg also uh, involved in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. <coughs> it could be. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Inter uh, in yeah, it'll be interesting to watch to see what happens. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. It must be a quite interesting story. Yeah. I'm finding I'm afraid that Microsoft is understanding about the. Embedded key or just sticking any other question? Yes, yes. Yeah. Anyway, do you have any? Okay. any is there any, any, anything else? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I'd like to ask about the, uh, the status of the print the patch. Uh, do you think the rest of the print, uh, rest of our D patch? Uh, will be merged in uh, five point. But I'm sorry, which patch? Ah, ah, pre -amp, uh, real time patch. Real time oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, yeah, I, it's, I think it's definitely going in. Uh, uh, Thomas, Thomas Leisner was, uh, I mean, I, he, he gave, he actually gave the closing keynote at, um, at Plumbers, um, and talked about the fact that uh, it's. It's like the nightmare is finally over. <laughs> He's been working on it for 19 years or something like that. And so I don't know, I think they recorded, I don't know if they recorded the keynote. I don't remember if I saw the video. It was a, it was a pretty entertaining talk. Yeah. Uh, but he talked about a lot of the challenges he faced uh, getting the real time to this point and how long he'd been working on it. He didn't realize, you know, until you, until you kind of take a step back and look at it, you don't realize how long it's been. Uh, but uh, I am I am very confident that in five five point four maybe five point five I mean stuff can always slip uh, but I think before the end of the summer well before the end of this year uh, we'll have a kernel that has all of the R P M P R T in it. Yeah, uh, I also are joined to your, to the we have that micro farmers at the yes uh, and the. Uh, uh, Thomas said that the, the older patches will be uh, going to 5.5. Uh, so the, the big issue there will be whether it'll hit, I don't know what the next LTS kernel is going to be, because that's the one that embedded yes. developers is going to pick up, right? So it'd be nice if it could make whatever the next LTS kernel was. 
So that would reduce a lot of people's uh, kind of patch maintenance burden. So 5.4 5, 5. or 5.5? 5. 5. 5. Uh, 5.4 is partially uh, support that are uh, real time. So that are uh, full patches are join, uh, going to 5.5. Uh, 5. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the information. Yeah. Maybe that's another, another issue is that can we trust uh, 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 Thomas Greisner or not? <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Thank you, Rita san and uh, thank you, Tim, for the presentation. Can I uh, ask something about automated testing? Uh, so I have a question about uh, if automated testing on uh, more IoT platforms or NatX, if you have any information about that. Did you see anything like that? I'm sorry, the sound is dropping out. So could you repeat the last part of that? Uh, for uh, maybe not Linux uh, platforms, but platforms with uh, uh, less resources that might be running like NatX. Have you seen any uh, like automated testing related to those? Uh, I have not. So um, there. So one of the one of the t talks uh, that I saw. I'm trying to remember if I already saw the talk or if it's a talk that's coming up at ELC. Oh, it's a talk that's coming up at ELC Europe. I think. Uh, it was on testing bootloaders uh, with automated testing, and so that's not that X, but it's a it's kind of similar in that it's not Linux, right? And there's a whole it, it's quite a bit different when you're testing the bootloader because the bootloader doesn't have all of the same facilities as Linux, right? You can't just SSH into it. It's usually got a shell that's quite different, um, and you are you are not you're not able to deploy stuff to the bootloader uh, at runtime. So, and that's one of the problems that Fuego has. Is Fuego, well, some of these systems really rely on the ability to manipulate the system in very Linux specific ways. You know, looking at the proc file system or, or using bash features to run shell commands, things like that. So all of those things get in the way of testing non-Linux things, particularly low-end non-Linux things. And uh, so, the fact that people are doing bootloader testing uh, does indicate that people are looking at non-Linux systems. But I haven't, I haven't heard of uh, anybody specifically testing NetX. Um, that was actually on one of my goals for Fuego. Uh, the way we've divided some of the stuff in Fuego, um, uh, in fact, I actually did some work on that last spring, but I didn't quite finish it. So. Um, I would really like to see these CI systems extended to be able to support non-Linux systems because I think it'll be a real big benefit for the whole industry. Um, I think that I, I would like to see open source testing become the way that people test stuff, not just test Linux. Yeah, thank you. It's interesting. Yeah, maybe the talk about the uh, uh, issue about uh, uh, testing on the NATX will be something quite new for the NATX people, so that it must be uh, quite interesting. Anyway, it, is it any other questions or topics to talk? Um, uh, Kim, thank you. Uh, could you back to the discussion? GCC optimization slide. Could you back to GCC optimization slide? Tim? Yeah. Uh, could you back to the GCC optimization slide? And the ELC again. Uh, could you hear me? I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear everything. Back to the slide uh, describing oh, go uh, back to the uh, GCC optimization. Okay. I don't know how far back it is. Maybe I should. It's all the way back in ELC, I think. Uh, oh. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. What tools have been introduced to, or can I find them in the presentation document? About. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Okay. Uh, tips. Use good tools. I'd like to know these tools. So, what tools have been introduced? Uh, what what tools were used? Yeah. So the the tools that um, well they're described in the presentation. So uh, you know I didn't I didn't list them out here, but uh, if you go so on on this particular talk, um, uh, I will I will so there's a page that describes the tools, but really the description of how they're used and what to use them for is going to be in the video. Um, so uh, you can you can go get the presentation now. I actually looked at this one or reviewed it uh, before I did the my slides here. Uh, but in order to get the the good information about how uh, Kim recommended to use the tools and, and what each one was useful for, uh, the tools were things like um, Readl and OBJDump and uh, some other things. I think they were mainly used for um, analyzing how the compiler was uh, actually um, producing the code and seeing like the different sections, how the section sizes were affected, and, and uh, the symbol tables and things like that. Uh, but you'd have to go to the presentation for more detail. Thank you. OK. And, and like I said, the best thing would be to wait for the video, because I think the video will be the best uh, best resource for understanding this talk. OK, thanks. I think this is on video, but you'll have, you'd have to search around for it. Uh, any other question? Yeah. Thank you, team. Uh, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, perhaps uh, we will hold a hold a in international session from you uh, to two weeks or in two weeks or so. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear. I didn't hear part of that. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know if the deal is with the mic, it's like cutting out quite a bit, so uh, it's hard to... Uh, what, what, what? Sorry, I, I was a bit away. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, I, I like, we'd like to say great appreciation for every effort for the, doing a good job on the technical attempt card member. Thank you very much, Tim. Oh. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Tim, could you please stay a little bit more? Yeah, I can stay for a little while.